Hello Zens, I have an announcement to make. We have a first participant at the Hanson Video Clip Festival. Next. January 1st, 2023, and today we'll be taking a walk through my Popo's backyard. Let's go. It's like y'all, we're going this way. This is the backyard. You okay? Okay. Let's go explore more of the yard. Surfing lesson. First stop is the stream. When I was a young child, my cousins and my sister and I would fish for crayfish. See you there. I was just admiring the top of the yard. My favorite part about the yard is that I can do my cartwheels. That's it for the tour, but there's one more stop. from me. Hope you enjoyed this tour. This is Journey Han from Honolulu, Hawaii signing off.
It was the third round, and I was controlling the fight. And I was so confident that I was going to win. Then, a liver shot. My whole body fell. My legs just became so numb, and my whole body just went down. Twenty eighteen was the hardest year of my life. Around the time of the boxing match, I also found that my mom was diagnosed with cancer. That was probably the lowest point of my life, seeing my mom in so much pain. But I remember what my mom told me that day. Someday in your life, life's gonna have you backed up against the ropes. It's gonna hit you hard in the liver and you'll fall down. But she said, you got two choices. Either you stay down till the count goes out and lose, or you can choose to stand up and fight till the end. I told you, all of my critics, I told you all that I was the greatest of all time. My mom's the strongest fighter I know. She's the one who taught me how to be resilient. Inside the ring or out, ain't nothing wrong with going down. It's staying down that's wrong.
so you can't find them. And you also can't talk because you're a mime, and at that, a nautical mime? Chiapas is one of Mexico's most biodiverse and resource-rich states, with a plethora of natural waterways. This summer, I worked with Cantaro Azul, a nonprofit based in Chiapas, in the city of San Cristobal de las Casas. Cantaro focuses on increasing indigenous communities' access to clean drinking water by developing independent water collection and treatment systems that are community-run. With the abundant water in Chiapas and San Cristobal, why would an organization like Cantaro be necessary? This story, unlike the water, runs deep. In 2018, the New York Times published an article highlighting the issue of water scarcity in San Cristobal. Residents from all different parts of the city shared their troubles accessing clean water. Though climate change does offer part of an explanation, as the city's rain patterns have changed, it does not explain the totality of the issue. Another key explanatory factor for the lack of potable water is the Coca-Cola bottling plant in San Cristobal, which draws more than 300,000 gallons of water per day, or roughly 110 million gallons of water a year. The people of San Cristobal have long protested the Coca-Cola plant. However, Coca-Cola's reach extends beyond simply using up water. Advertising and the drink itself are ubiquitous. Then and now in San Cristobal, Coke is cheaper and more available than water. I had registered this as fact prior to my work there, but words on a page can only capture so much of a picture. Chiapas consumes more Coca-Cola per person than anywhere else in the world. Over 180 gallons per person per year. For comparison, the US average is 26 gallons. Coca-Cola's availability and actions in Chiapas have sparked a diabetes and obesity epidemic in the region, leading to a 40% increase in diabetes prevalence in the last decade and more than 3,000 deaths annually. With all of this in mind, I was curious to see how San Cristobal has changed and been shaped by this issue. While in San Cristobal, I walked most places to get water at the corner store, groceries at the market, 
to the central square, and of course, my daily commute to work. One thing I kept noticing on my walk to work was street art, specifically these tags of Taraz, Carlos Seas, Decadence, and Eric Rizzo. I began to recognize their style and common visual motifs that I saw throughout the city. Eyes and mouths for Taraz, wheels and bugs for Carlos Sea, and tags for Decadence. I started to keep an eye out for street art around town, and I saw a variety of different types of art. I saw politically charged art, advertisements for businesses, and artists trying to get their work out there. I noticed there were clusters of art in certain areas, sometimes in sharp contrast to blank walls just around the corner. This map shows the geotagged locations of pictures I took of street art, and while you can clearly see my commute, there's also a cluster in Barrio El Cerillo, on the north side of the city. With my curiosity growing, I took a tour to better understand the context of street art in the city. One common subject on the tour was INA, or Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia, the Mexican government agency tasked with cultural preservation. San Cristobal is designated as a Pueblo Magico, or magic town, for its cultural heritage. Part of that designation requires maintenance of what INA determines to be culturally relevant in order to receive the funding from the federal government. In San Cristobal, that includes the historical center of the city, 18 blocks or so surrounding the central plaza, outlined in blue on this map. Interestingly, those 18 blocks were where I most often encountered street art. When I interviewed Eric Rizzo, a local street artist, he described a lot of tension over control of this space. Pero, este, por ejemplo, acá los esos, esos espacios que son para para que te expreses, sí. son los que más bloquea la la gente municipal aquí, la presidencia. Entonces, no puedes llegar ahí a menos que seas un Do you miss home? Where is home to you? What is it like being away from home for so long? These are questions I always get as an international student. My name is Yuka, and if you don't know me, I'm a junior at Hanson, and I spent half of my life in China and half of my life in Japan. This winter, I visited Singapore, the place my parents moved to after I left Japan for rice. This video is a combination of me enjoying the time I spent with my family and me learning about Singapore. When I first got to Singapore, I got a reverse culture shock. I thought I came up with a new theory, but reverse culture shock is a thing. It made me remember how different where I grew up is from the US. Underground metros are everywhere transportation. in Asia, and I can pretty much go Underground anywhere for under everywhere in Asia, and I can pretty the system much go is well regulated, so I feel safe riding the metro. By the system is well regulated, totally so I feel different safe from my red line the metro, metro experiences in Houston. Totally different from my red line metro experiences in Houston. There is also no reason in the U.S. to be outside at night, since everything is closed other than bars and clubs, which people find Uber safer and more convenient, anyways. Which brings me to the second. Additionally, difference. there's stuff a lot to of do stuff at to night. do at night. I didn't say nightlife because I don't necessarily mean bars and clubs. In China and Singapore, there are many shopping malls with cool art installations and a variety of restaurants that are open until 10 p.m. Even after, many people walk around outside, and the city is lively. Even though Singapore is geographically really small, about one third the size of Houston. There were lots to do and eat in the month I was there. These are all the things I grew up around, but after living in the U.S. for three years, I totally forgot what Asia is like. Spending a month riding public transportation, enjoying late night walks, seeing Chinese advertisements, eating authentic Asian food. I realized I took aspects of my culture for granted. To answer my questions from the beginning, yes, I miss home, but where is home? Is it within the borders of China, Japan? When I went to Singapore, I felt at home in the bustling subway stations or on a calm evening walk. Singapore is not exactly where I grew up, but to me, it was like going home, seeing my parents, and eating home-cooked food for the first time since I left for college in 2020. Being 
with my family reminded me that home wasn't a place, but a practice, a people. Connecting with these things reminded us where we came from. So don't discount eating familiar cuisines, seeing the ones who raised you, or singing along to a song in your native tongue. There's more home in those things than four walls and a roof. Thank <laughs> you.